Jack Harlow was stuck between a rock and a hard place. Commercially successful yet not celebrated, cherished by non-hip-hop fans but overlooked by rap's hardcore fan base, he finds himself in a spot that may be uncomfortable but is in no way unfamiliar. For decades now, white rappers have always tried to make their mark on the culture and be taken as seriously as black rappers. But more often than not, they find themselves frozen in time at the point of their greatest hit. And for the most part, the only way is down. Because when they're not seen as bringing anything new to the culture and are just rehashing the current trendy sound, i.e. Ian, Lil Maybu, etc., then it's incredibly easy for them to get forgotten. Yet because they often get more attention than black rappers who are in the same lane and often make more compelling music, it makes people suspicious of them. And if we know one thing about hip-hop fans, it's that they don't like being spoon-fed an artist by the industry. This, in essence, is what separates an Eminem from a G-Eazy, or an LP from a Snow, or perhaps a Mac Miller from a Jack Harlow himself, as in the years that have followed the release of what should have been his breakout album in 2022's Come Home, The Kids Miss You, the charismatic Kentucky rapper has had a strange road to walk, because on the one hand, he's a perfectly passable rapper, and by all accounts, seems like a good guy. But the problem is that when the industry happened to come across this pale-skinned MC with a radio-friendly approach to songwriting and enough riz to spawn viral content online, they inevitably saw dollar signs. And at this point, he fell into the trap that's all too familiar for white rappers. When Jack was on the come up, he was a rapper who seemed to have organically garnered his audience as he'd been rapping since he was a kid. As a result, there was no reason for anyone to feel like he was an industry plant or that he was a threat to the status quo of hip-hop. But as the hit singles racked up, this perception began to change. And as Sean C argues, when it comes to Jack being accepted among the ranks of mainstream hip-hop, the success of What's Poppin' and later First Class was a gift and a curse that changed how the culture treated him. Suddenly thrust into a lane of megastars who attend fashion shows, Jack was on top of the world as he approached the release of come home the kids miss you so much so that in a 2022 interview with rolling stone he basically told them that he was going to be the king of hip-hop being number one is what made eminem so hard he was in the dog pile i want to be the face of my generation for these next 10 years we need more people in my generation that are trying to be the best and you can't do that with just ear candy vibe records you gotta come out swinging sometimes a press run that hyped him up as though he truly was the next up jack clearly articulated the lead he thought he was in during every press obligation around that time and that was one of the leaders of the new school I mean, yeah, absolutely. You know, you get pushed the same way that Cole, Kendrick, Drake, they were keeping each other in mind to some degree right. over the 2010s and pushing each other. Huge shout out to Doja. You have like Lil Baby. Lil mm -hmm. Baby's amazing. I think Baby Keem has a massive trajectory. There's a lot of good ones. However, what separates Jack Harlow from all the artists he mentioned can't be understated. As with Doja Cat and Baby Keem especially, like them or hate them, they have a distinct sound that is unmistakably them. While when Come Home The Kids Miss You dropped, the sound was so middle of the road that it was hard to pin down his identity at all. Reviewed by Pitchfork in their scathingly negative review as a one-trick pony without a discernible trick, the same review would go on to describe him as a competent rapper who doesn't flow intricately or write impressively, and a pop star who struggles to carry a song on his own. Ouch the album pretty much getting trashed across the board and underperforming commercially in terms of sales, Jack had a project that sold upwards of 100,000 units, but at what cost? Well, for those who never saw the hype or our previous video about Jack Harlow, which you should probably check out before this video, it just cemented their perception of him. Basically, that he wasn't great, nor was he terrible. He was just another white rapper in a sea of white rappers who never truly found a sense of who they are as an artist. For most of 2022, Jack Harlow was inescapable. He was on at least two top hits that I feel like happened last year. There was countless discourse about him online. He won a BET award, made a movie, hosted a college football show, and then quickly laid an egg with his subsequent major release before then disappearing to regroup and figure out what the with wrong. It was an immense musical anti-climax that I think a lot of people saw coming, but more and more people were happy to see happen. Something about Harlow's rise to fame rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. It was a bit of a paradox, though, because while Harlow had so much fanfare and hype as well as hate, his actual music was just mid it was like perfectly in the middle and disposable which is probably why he didn't go anywhere but it didn't make sense that he had so much hype and hate in the first place rejected as the next drake jack tried to reclaim this identity with his next project jackman a grittier minimal back to basics project this album was received far better than come home the kids miss you but even then people felt like they knew why he created the album in the first place and that was the negative response to his attempts to go fully mainstream and even then pitchfork didn't go any easier on him stating that trends and other people's opinions mold his records the internet said he was too cornerly commercial so for the duration of this album he positions himself as a very serious rapper Still, although the project was generally better received by hip-hop, it 
have muddied the waters as to who his audience truly was. Because for those who might have loved what was being served up on Come Home The Kids Miss You, this was likely a curveball for them. And more than likely, it was viewed the same way by his record label who didn't put anywhere near the same promotional push behind the project. Yeah, that's why this is weird to me. He just sold way too many records and they put way too much money in, in him just now. And he did all right. I know you have to spend money to get a return and this is silent. This is quiet. Mm -hmm. So I would be interested to see that this sound like less than 30,000 copies. Just as Joe predicted, the album debuted at number 8 on the charts with just 33,000 sales. Yet, without dwelling on it for too long or even touring his new album, Jack would be ushered back into the commercial lane with a song that took six songwriters to produce. Released just seven months after Jackman didn't spawn a single hit, Lovin' On Me became a number one without anyone really understanding what happened. A catchy, radio-friendly pop tune, its rise was so inconspicuous that Yassine rightfully declared that it was the fakest number one ever on Twitter. As for how he did it, the answer, as is always the case with Jack, is that it was nothing new. Instead, it was merely relying on a formula that had worked the last time he scored a chart-topping hit right down to its rollout. Definitely the sample, said Kyle Dennis of Billboard. That melody coupled with a beat that feels familiar enough to recall Drake's The Motto, but distinct enough to feel like it's its own entity, makes for a track with several key components to latch onto. More importantly, like first class, Lovin' On Me finds Jack rapping to the ladies, and there isn't much of that happening in rap music right now. Having used the same kind of TikTok marketing that helped make first class a hit and focusing on his female fan base, Jack managed to put himself back on top, and the higher-ups at his record label, Atlantic, are likely celebrating. Considering how this formula paid off again, it seems highly unlikely that he'll be given the chance to do a record like Jackman again. Because whether he'd like to accept it or not, three number ones in three years means he's officially a cash cow in the eyes of record labels. But it isn't so much about Jack or his music itself, but because he fulfills a need that the music industry has. As whether they'd like to admit it or not, they're always seeking the next white superstar. When it comes to like the mainstream point of view, most people are like, oh yeah, here's a new one. And they adopt kind of the hip hop style, add nothing to it, move from it, and people kind of forget about him. And then the next one comes in and do the same thing. With Jack Harlow, I think people look at him as so much more authentic because he is or comes across as such a nice dude. And he seems really respectful for the most part of other cultures and their demographic from what I've seen. Never have I seen that level of personality able to carry someone so far when the music is just so average. There's nothing about it that takes anything farther. I don't know what it is about white artists that just makes it so, yeah, this is the one. When there are a million other of the exact same of this guy that are black, that do the same thing and that do it better for the most part. As opposed to being a conspiracy hypothesis, this is a well-documented thread throughout hip-hop history that began with Vanilla Ice. Because although he started out as just a white kid trying to step into a world where he was the outlier, Vanilla Ice's success taught the music industry a valuable lesson. And that was, if they wanted maximum profit and crossover appeal to middle-class white America who spent the most money, then a white figurehead was essential. Yeah. They embraced me, man. And that, my whole crowd was always black. I never thought I'd ever play for white people until my music went number one. And when it went number one, I went from smaller crowds to huge stadiums in rap music. It just hadn't been done like that before. So for me, I was just like, whoa. With Ice Ice Baby, the music industry had pulled off a successful experiment and have tried to go back to the well ever since with questionable success. For Ice's part, he admitted back then that his success came to a certain level of manufacturing, as well as his skin tone. Being white helps me, I guess, but I wish it didn't, he told the New York Times. My being white had something to do with it, but not much as they say it does. It depends on the contract you sign with the record company. They can make you number one if they push you enough. But that didn't necessarily mean it was smooth sailing for Vanilla Ice, because while he was the most successful rapper of his ilk, he also also set the precedent of being accused of co-opting the culture. Chewed out by Arsenio Hall for lying about his background, Vanilla Ice was one of many white rappers who'd come into hip-hop without ever truly advancing it. Instead, he towed the line of what was popular and reaped the rewards. And while he may have come into the game with the best of intentions, ultimately, money talks. I was three car payments behind on my 5.0, and I was 19 at that time. It was like I won the lottery, man. It's like what do you want me to do? At that point, the hip-hop community had kind of labeled me a sellout. So I did. I sold out. I took the money. I sold way out. And I think anybody in my shoes would have done the same damn thing. Although he's nowhere near viewed as a sellout to the same extent as Vanilla Ice, there's no denying that Jack is undergoing a process of corporatization. Suddenly given brand deals with Doritos, KFC, New Balance, and others, Jack even recently made the transition into acting with White Men Can't Jump. In some ways, a move that could be seen as his equivalent of Vanilla Ice is providing the soundtrack to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie with Ninja Rap. To make matters worse, he was suddenly being compared to other people who transitioned from hip-hop to movies but aren't necessarily respected by the culture. And when he was hit with one comparison in particular, he didn't know how to respond. 
Cal Maddock compares you to Mark Wahlberg, says you are going to be the next Mark Wahlberg. What does that mean to you, especially coming from somebody so talented and so great like Cal Maddock? Feels real good, you know. I like Mark Wahlberg, so I'll take that. <laughs> Suddenly taken from being positioned next to Drake and calling himself the hardest white dude since the one with vomit on his sweater, to being compared to Marky Mark, it's clear that whatever ideas Harlow has about himself and his place in hip hop, the industry have other plans. Just look at the rollout for Love and All Me, where he previously visited the Breakfast Club and other spots like that, Jack didn't promote the single on the usual hip hop media cycle. Instead, he appeared on the Call Her Daddy podcast, whose 5 million monthly listeners are predominantly white females. Because at the minute, this is what Jack Harlow was doing. He's taking mainstream hip hop as it stands and repackaging it to be sold to an audience of women who thirst over him. He's not doing anything new, nor is he trying to advance the game. He's just doing what sells. And if that remains the case, he'll always be held at arm's length by hip hop. By contrast, this is also where Eminem thrived, but he had to learn the hard way that he had to find a sound of his own. Eminem knows, unlike most other walks of life, that his skin color is actually kind of going to be a barrier to his goals. Nobody wants another corny white guy trying to be black and trying to rap. And he had to learn this the hard way with his first independent album, Infinite, which sold like 5,000 records. Once Infinite flopped, the slim shady persona was born and the rest, as they say, is history. Similarly, this is a crucial difference to Mac Miller, who actively found his own niche in the game and was universally loved for it. Instead of trying to take it and run with it, acting as if you came up with it or this fresh new idea that's just for you only, there's a respectful way to do it. And I think Mac Miller was probably one of the only few to be able to do that and no one giving for it. While no one is saying that Jack Harlow isn't capable of doing something genre bending in his own right, the problem was that where Mac and Eminem both pivoted in their career, Jack is now in the era of his career where he's a chart topper. And at that point, there's too many eyes on you to be risky and experiment in the same way. And unfortunately for white rappers, all it takes is one misstep and you're cemented into a space you can't get out of. For example, just look at Macklemore. Once Thrift Shop took off, he was seen as a commercial entity, and the subsequent album, The Heist, further solidified that. Then the unthinkable happened and he won a Grammy for Best Rap Album over Kendrick Lamar. But rather than embrace it, he apologized to K-Dot publicly and was immediately accused of pandering. And no matter what happens now, it's still the first thing people think of when his name pops up. And I'm struggling with my own like, damn, I'm benefiting from the system that I've been calling out since I was 20 years old. And here I am at the highest level of artistic merit, the Grammys, and here I am benefiting from the same that I've been talking about. So I was conflicted. Mm. People want to say like, oh, it was guilt. He just feels guilty about being white. It's like, that's so surface level. Was there an air of that? Absolutely. Was that the reason? Absolutely not at the forefront. By saying that K-Dot's music was more worthy of the recognition than his, he basically openly admitted that he was merely emulating the culture, not advancing. Much like Macklemore, Jack Harlow hasn't necessarily done anything to disprove that theory either. And now that the label understands his earning power, it's likely to be all take, take, take from here on out, whether or not that's his intention or not. No matter how much a white rapper tries to be respectful and tries not to be harmful, the forces of capitalism and commerce at these corporations they're going to use whiteness and that person as a spear to penetrate every other aspect of the culture. And even as they're just minding their business and trying to make art, the harm will follow them regardless of how hard they try to avoid it. No matter how much effort is being put into the culture, no matter how much genuine talent is present in these white artists, their whiteness will always be the most important and valuable aspect of their art. It legit sucks for them. Positioned as a hit maker rather than a true hip hop artist, Jack Harlow has been handed the baton by major labels to lead as the next big white artist. With his label eager to continue to drip feed him hit songs, Jack finds himself in a tough spot. He can either follow the white rapper formula of guaranteed monetary gain, but risk being forgotten in hip hop's history books, or he could dig deep, take a gamble on himself, and break away from the white rapper curse by producing a genuine genre-bending album. Only time will tell which path he chooses.